Say, uh, we, got, uh, we got word on Friday, or uh, I did, in, in my office uh, about the death of a, of a brother of someone who has attended our church. Uh, his brother was in the ICU in St. Louis and uh, intubated due to COVID and lost his battle on Friday afternoon. He was 42 years old and left behind a wife and children, so please be in prayer for his family, if you would. This morning, we'll, uh, we'll be continuing our study in the books of, of James in a series entitled Advice from a Brother You Can Trust, and this is part 22, and entitled No One Can Tame the Tongue, and we'll be looking at James 3, 7 to 8, and the advice that James will give us there, so let's get started. Last week, we looked at James chapter 3, verses 3 through 6, and we looked at that passage through the, through the lens of a, of a story about a man named Elisha as he began his ministry as the prophet in Israel. God had made it clear to Elisha that he would be the one to replace Elijah, and God did that by providing Elisha with Elijah's cloak after Elijah was taken up in the chariot of fire. Elisha performed a a couple of miracles right out of the gate and gave evidence that he was indeed God's choice uh, as a replacement for Elijah. And after that, Elijah left the city of Jericho where he had been staying and he began his trip to Samaria. As he journeyed, he was accosted by a large group of boys who began to taunt him and make fun of his bald head as they shouted, get out of here, baldy, get out of here, baldy, get out. You can imagine how much fun that would be. Elisha didn't take kindly to the joking about his bald head, most probably because bald-headed people sometimes feel Uh, that only other bald-headed people should be allowed to make fun of them. I I don't know, I've heard that anyway. But So in this group of boys, uh, who who most probably had not yet lost their hair, uh, you know, being boys still, when they made fun of Elisha, he took it quite personally. According to the story, in God's word, Elisha called down a curse on them from heaven, and Elisha wasn't specific about the details of the curse or what it should include, So God took it upon himself to make that call, as he often does. God rallied two bears to come out of the woods and attack the boys, and the bears made a point of bouncing around the 42 boys. They may have been Chicago bears, I I don't know. We use that story to illustrate that we all have to learn to be careful what we say. We all have to learn to be careful what we, what we say. We all have to be careful about what we say because our words have weight and what we say have consequences. The boys, you know, I don't think that's the right PowerPoint. Well, that's good. I love it when Brian and I agree on something, especially that important. Oh, okay, well, that's going to make the message fun because they're not... (laughs) 
You're on your own, okay? You just make up the slides. Uh, we could, it, it's on that thing in my, uh, on my bag in my office if, I don't know, you, you do what you think. Uh, our words have weight, and what we say has consequences. The boys, in that particular case, immediately experienced the consequences of what they said, but we all know that, it, that life doesn't work like that always. It doesn't always work that way. Sometimes we become aware of the consequences of what we've said weeks or, or even months later. Sometimes there are consequences to the things that we've said, but we never uh, become aware of it. Uh, we, we compared that story that, that we looked at in 2 Kings to what James had to say to us in chapter 3. We discovered, I, I hope, that, that sometimes there are consequences to the things that we say. I hope we discovered that. Sometimes those consequences, like the bears, come back to bite us in the, in the form of people reacting to what we said to them. Sometimes the consequences come back to us by people deciding not to say anything to us personally, uh, but then they dismiss us in terms of the freedom that we used to have in, uh, to have an impact on their lives. And all along, we kept repeating the mantra last week, our words have weight, and what we say carries consequences. Our words have weight, and what we say carries consequences. And from that, we made the decision that we, th that we should think through our words before we, see we use them. We, we made the decision that we should think about the things that we're going to say before we say them, instead of having to, being forced to think about it later. At least, I hope that we all made that decision last week, because this week, James is, is going to build, he's going to continue to build on that foundation that he's been laying about this thing with the tongue and the things that we say, and I think that we're all aware that it's very unwise to continue building on something if the foundation is not sturdy. If we don't take time with the foundation first, then building on top of it is really foolish. We don't want to be caught off guard this week when James asks us, ask us to continue this week to build on that same structure. So I suffer consequences when I speak without thinking, but the same would be true for other people. Other people suffer consequences when they listen to and believe what we've said. If we've been careless about what we say or how we use our words, the consequences for other people can be merely distracting, I suppose, but it's equally possible that the consequences of what we say to other people could be disastrous or even deadly. James has been telling us, and last week he drove the point home, that our tongues are like fires. Our tongues can kindle fires in our own lives as we suffer consequences for the things that, that we say. And once again, that's a point that James has made last week when he said that the whole course of your life can be set on fire by your simply choosing to speak without thinking. And this is something that's even more true today than it was when James wrote. That's because we're surrounded on all sides by something that we, uh, that we warmly call cancel culture. People have lost their jobs because of things that they've said. Now again, I'm, I'm not coming out in favor of cancel culture or against cancel culture. I'm simply saying that the climate that surrounds us now makes it easier for people to cancel us, whatever that may mean, to cancel us for our comments that we make in their hearing. And their ability to hear you is as simple as your choosing to hit the send button. Remember, when they cancel us, we lose our ability to have input into their lives. We may come to the point where we want to tell them about Jesus, but they've canceled us already because of a previous comment that we've made. So they don't want to hear anything that we have to say. There's grave danger when you make a comment without thinking. I reminded you last week that you hold me accountable every time I, I take stand up here on this platform and, and tell you what I think. And, and that's essentially what a message is. It's a collection of thoughts that have been prompted by the study that I've done standing there in my office, uh, in my study in God's Word during the previous week. And you've probably already figured out that I stand up here and share the thoughts that I've discovered from God's Word because I want to influence your thinking. That's why I do it. Having said that, I have to say that I want to influence your thinking not by what I say, but by what God's Word says. I'm convinced, personally convinced, that we'd all live joy-filled lives if we could only learn to think about things the way that God thinks about them. 
So I take this platform and I start talking about what I think, and in the meantime, you make sure that you require of me that I think through what I'm going to say before I stand on this platform. I'm aware of the tradition that's out there that, uh, that, that some preachers use, and I, I wish I could use this because it would save so much time. They inhale the Spirit of God as they're speaking up front, and then they exhale the truth that comes from God's Word. Well, it would be such a handy way to be able to preach, you know, if you didn't have to study all week. And I, I guess I'm belittling that, and that was a, potentially a cancel culture comment. So I'll just I'll, I'll leave that off. But you require that I, I take my time to prepare. But more importantly, I require of me that I think through what I'm going to say before I stand up on this platform. Now, this is not the only platform on which you or I stand. You also have a platform on social media. You stand on the platform of social media, and, and you tell everyone who's listening what you think. They're then able to hear your words on the platform of social media in the same way that you hear my words when I stand on this platform on a Sunday morning. And when you post something on social media, you have the same goal that I have when I say something from this platform on a Sunday morning. You want to influence others to think like you think. That's why we take to social media. And that's when the rest of us have to hope that you've taken God's thinking into consideration before you put your thoughts out there for the sake of, of influencing other people. Sometimes your words have impact on others, and sometimes they don't. That's because just as people can be dismissive of me because of something that I say on this platform, they can be equally dismissive of you because of something that you've said on the platform of social media. It only takes one thing that, that, that you might say that they consider to be foolish, and you've lost all opportunity to influence their thinking. They may choose to be dismissive of you. They may choose to argue with you. They may choose to unfriend you. They may choose to simply not check what you have to say as they're browsing their feed. They just set you aside. But as we mentioned last week, there may be even more serious consequences for them if they listen to you. And it should be sobering for all of us to realize that when we tell other people what we think, it can turn deadly for them if they listen to what we have to say. Times like that, we must take the time. We have to take the time to be doubly sure that our opinion is correct. The problem is that there's ever so many opinions out there on the platform of social media. Some of those opinions come directly from you, uh, while some of them come from someone that you're following. You may tell people that they should do this, and, or that they, they, you may tell them that they should definitely not do that. They, of course, are free to choose, but if they choose to do or not do something because you said that they should do or not do it, then you've played a role in the consequences that those people will suffer because they took your advice. We might all be quick to say that that guy or that gal is a free agent. We might say that that person is free to do whatever they want to do and then add, yeah, I gave them the advice and they took that advice, but it's not my fault that they suffered those consequences. That's in the cases when you know someone has taken your advice. We don't always know. But that's when James' words, when we take that attitude, that's when James' words here become so powerful and important because last week he likened our tongue to something that can kindle a fire. So we used our words and someone listened to what we said and then they either did or did not do the thing that we said they should or should not do. The thing that we recommended. If someone does something because I advised them to do it and then later they suffer consequences that can be potentially deadly, then I would have to admit that I bear some responsibility for what happened to them. We took that from the idea that our tongue kindles fires in other people's lives as well as in our own. We might say or might want to say that, yes, I did give him that advice, but he's the one who took the advice. So it's, it's, it's his fault. It's not my fault that he suffered those consequences. But remembering that the tongue is like a fire that kindles other fires, if I say that it's not my fault that he suffered the consequences of taking my advice, then that's like saying, yes, I set his house on fire, but it's not my fault that he got burned. 
That's why we're saying that we must consider the consequences of what we say before we say it. Once the words are out there, you can't unsay them. Have you noticed that? And the person cannot unread them or unhear them. And by now, you've surely understood that taking something back that you've said on social media is as impossible as getting the feathers back into the pillow once the pillow has exploded in the wind. James is going to have more to say to us this morning, and I'm aware that it might be threatening to you if you accept what James says. I have to say that I don't want to offend you this morning. Struggled with this all week. But I'm willing to take the risk of offending you if... You make the decision in the end to be careful what you say. As someone who makes his living by giving people advice either up here or in my office, I am begging you to think before you speak and make sure that you understand the possible consequences for the person who might take your advice. Last year, we all joked about how we ran out of toilet paper in the stores. You, you remember that? That was one of our favorite things in 2020 because we got advice on social media that we should stockpile toilet paper, so we all did, and then there wasn't any toilet paper to stockpile. And, and that was all a joke, and it was in good fun. But the things that we're giving advice about on social media about these days are no joke because the advice that we give potentially carries deadly consequences. So be as clever as you care to be when you give people advice over social media, but make sure that you think through the potential consequences for them if they listen to you, take your advice, believe you, and put it into practice. And as I say that, I have to add that I want you to make the decision to be careful what you say, not because I've told you to, but because you've learned as I've learned that my words have weight and what I say carries consequences. Now it's time to move on to what the Spirit of God has for us today and the advice that James will be giving us. <laughs> and this is where I would typically say, um, uh, just sit and mumble. You can't stand and read with me. Because, well, it, it's in an even worse state than it was before. James chapter 3, verses 7 and 8 says, All kinds of animals... Birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. And uh, you can take your seats because we know that God blesses us with his truth uh, whenever we read his word, even when his truth says something as well as accused like that. The story that I want to tell you this morning comes from the Gospels and has primarily to do with the Apostle Peter. Uh, Jesus has been traveling with his followers and, and they were nearing the end, as they're nearing the end of their three-year ministry together, and, and he's most recently sent out the 12, he's fed the 5,000, he's declared that he's the Messiah, and then he's finally revealed to his followers that, that he would be rejected by the elders in Israel uh, and by the chief priests and the teachers of the law and that he would be killed. And then on the third day, he'll rise again. And with that background, this is the story from God's word from Mark chapter 9 and Luke chapter 9. About eight days after the stuff, all that stuff that I told you about happened, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his three closest friends with him, up onto the top of a high mountain because he wanted to take some time to pray. Peter, James, and John fairly quickly fell asleep, which will become their tradition, while Jesus prayed alone. And as he was praying, his face began to change, and his clothes became as bright as a, a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, yeah, that Moses and Elijah, appeared in the same glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke to him about his departure and his death that was about to take place in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions, James and John, woke up and were very sleepy. But when they became fully awake, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men standing with him and conversing. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter spoke up suddenly and said to Jesus, Master, it's a really good thing that we're here because I have an idea. Let's put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Truth be told, 
He didn't know what he was saying, and he was only saying anything at all because he and his buddies were terrified. Look it up. It actually says that in the Scripture. While Peter was sharing this, his new idea, a cloud appeared and settled down over them. It covered them all, and they were afraid as the cloud encased them. And then a booming voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen, my son whom I love. So listen to him. When the voice had spoken, the cloud faded. And when they looked up, they saw that they and Jesus were alone. Peter, James, and John kept this to themselves. And they didn't tell any of the other followers what they had seen that day. And that's the story from God's Word. I love this story about Peter. I, I take comfort from it. Peter is a man that I think I understand on at least one level. Uh, part of the reason that I identify with Peter is his occasional impulsiveness. But despite his impulsiveness, I have to say that Peter did some pretty amazing things when you think about it. He spoke at the day of Pentecost and challenged the very people that had killed Jesus only weeks before. He wrote two books of the New Testament. He was one of Jesus' best friends. And at one point in his life, he even walked on water. There's a lot to respect about this guy. I have deep respect for the man, but I identify with this other side of him. This rashness, this thoughtlessness, this foolishness that popped up so often in his dealings with people. Peter was one of those people who sometimes spoke without thinking, and this story is an excellent illustration of that. I, I don't think that we can even begin to imagine how magnificent that moment was as Jesus was glowing so brightly that his clothes couldn't contain the brightness of the light. He's even described, he looked like a bolt of lightning wearing clothes as he stood there on that hill, and so did Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah are glowing with the same magnificent splendor, splendor while, they're, while they're talking with Jesus. As all of this magnificence is going on, Peter, who should have maintained quiet reverence, trust me on this one, decided to say something. And that's where he came up with the idea of the three shelters. One that Moses could live in, one that Elijah could live in, and one that Jesus could live in. And that's the point where I want to say, Peter, seriously? That's the best thing you can think of at this moment? That's your idea? I sometimes say that there are people who have something to say, and there are other people who just have to say something. And this particular moment in Peter's life seems to have come from the latter. He didn't really have anything wise to say, but he felt the need to say something for some reason. So he came up with this off-the-wall idea of building three shelters. Of course, then comes the moment that that booming voice comes from heaven, and God the Father identified Jesus as the son that he loved, and God then added that Peter, James, and John should listen to Jesus. I'm not sure that that was a dig against Peter and what Peter had just said, but I, I'm keeping that possibility on the table. All of this, I think, points up the fact that even the wisest people from, from time to time say something that's foolish. And that would imply that even the most foolish people from time to time say something wise. And that's why it's important that we make a difference between what is being said and who is saying it. Let me say that again. We need to make a difference between what is being said and who is saying it. Think about it. Peter was indeed a wise man, but that doesn't mean that everything that he said was wise. I was part of a committee for several years that oversaw and administered the ministries that were going on in the country where we were all working there at that time. Uh, that committee met four times a year, and, and I had the responsibility of generating the agenda. We'd all get together at the very beginning of the meetings, and usually they would last for five full work days. We'd get together at the beginning of the meetings, and I'd walk people down through the, the agenda so that we could schedule when we're going to meet with various people. And there was a, a, a man on the field at that time that I'll call George, who would often ask to meet with the committee. And this was kind of a habit that he had. He follow, followed a, a well-established pattern every time he met with us. He used the time with the committee to tell us very plainly that the sky is falling. He, the, the sky was always falling when this guy met with the committee. And if we didn't take immediate action on the particular thing that he had come to talk to us about, all would be lost. It was clear as we talked to him. 
And it was always the same. The sky was always falling. It got to the place after a while that when I'd walk people through the agenda and say that George wanted to meet with us, there'd be this uneasy fidgeting among the committee members, and it seemed that everyone on the committee would just kind of roll their eyes when they heard that George was coming in. I knew that they were uncomfortable and hesitant, and that's when I discovered the truth of what I said moments ago. We have to make a difference between what's being said and who's saying it. I shared that with the committee and, and told them that I know that George always tells us that the sky is falling. But what's going to happen if he comes in and tells us that the sky is falling and this particular time he's right? What if the sky is actually falling? If we categorically ignore things just because George is the one who's saying them, then we might miss a warning that God is sending us through George about something that really could spell the demise of everything that we're trying to do. George never did have a meeting with us when he didn't say that the sky was falling. And I can't categorically say that he was ever actually right. I can say that the sky never fell during the time that that committee was working together. All that to say that George was not a fool, but his constant insistence that the sky was falling did seem foolish to us. Still, if we had dismissed him as a fool, then at the moment that he did say something wise, we would have missed it and suffered the consequences, possibly including having the sky fall on our heads. Again, we must learn to make a difference between what is being said and who is saying it. Because wise people sometimes say foolish things. And foolish people sometimes say wise things. I've mentioned to you before that I was a, a coordinating director for a mission organization in Asia there for several years. And in that role, I did a lot of traveling, and, and sometimes I'd spend as much as six to ten weeks in a country other than the Philippines, so, you know, the country that we were living in. On one occasion, I was going to be in Thailand for six full weeks, and so I took faith in our daughter Bethany, who was the only of our three kids that were, was left at home at the time. Uh, I, I took them along with me to, to Thailand on that trip. I were constantly busy with stuff that needed to be done, but on one particular occasion, we, find the we found the time to go out to an elephant sanctuary. I don't know if you've ever done this. If you ever go to Thailand, you should go to an elephant sanctuary. Elephants are still widely used in Thailand, but in many places, modern machinery has replaced them, and, and, and so some of the elephants have ended up in sanctuaries with nothing to do. At this particular sanctuary, the first thing they did, this is kind of cool, they gave us the opportunity to buy large, you know, combs, hands, bunches of bananas. Uh, we then took the bananas over to where the elephants were all standing in line, and there were, there were no mahouts sitting on the elephants, so they were, you know, they were just kind of on their own and at their own discretion. Uh, but the people who ran the camp said that we should go and feed the elephants the bananas that we had bought. They told us to hold the bananas, you know, the big stock behind our back, and then grab a banana and, and give them to the elephants one at a time. They said that we should not, under any circumstances, let the elephants take the bananas away from us. That's good advice. Faith and Bethany and I took a large hand of bananas each, and, and we held it behind our backs, and, and, and we walked up to the elephants, and then we broke off one banana at a time, just like they said, and, and we offered it to the nearest elephant. And I happened to find myself standing in front of a massive bull elephant. He was 10 feet tall at the shoulder, weighed about 11,000 pounds. And uh, I, I kept the bananas behind my back and was offering them to him one at a time, just like I had been told to do. But suddenly, I felt something wrap around my leg and pull on it. And uh, I complete, completely lost my footing, nearly fell flat on my face, and realized immediately then an elephant must have a hold of me. When I was finally able to spin around, I, I, I noticed that an elephant did indeed have a hold of me, an elephant that had only been born six days before. He was six days old, but still able to pull me right off my feet because he outweighed me three to one. He weighed more than 600 pounds. When I recovered from having been pulled over by the baby elephant, I turned back around, put the bananas behind my back like I was supposed to, and began to offer them again to this 10-foot-tall, 11,000-pound behemoth. And that's when it occurred to me that, that the people who ran the camp had told me that, that under no circumstances should I let the elephant take the bananas away from me. But then I, I thought to myself, if this bull elephant really wants the bananas that are behind my back, 
what are the chances that I'll be able to prevent him from getting them? I, I mean, I laughed to myself. Faith and Bethany thought I was just having fun, but that was just a very amusing and frightening thought. And that's when I thought to myself, how do you train an animal that large to be that gentle? During the day, we watch the elephants play soccer. We watch them, one of them sit down and paint a picture. We watch one of them play a harmonica and dance. And all in all, it was a fabulous day. On the bus ride home that afternoon, I kept asking myself that same question. How do you train an animal that large to do what you want it to do? I mean, if you have a chihuahua, I, I, I'm sorry for you, but if you have a chihuahua and you want to train it to sit, you look at the chihuahua and you say, sit. And if the chihuahua doesn't sit, then you push his little behind down onto the floor and you make him sit so that he can learn the pattern, right? That's how we do it. But that elephant that had done the painting earlier in the day had actually sat down when he did the painting. And I didn't even bother to figure out how he did the painting, but how'd the trainer get him to sit down the first time? I'm sure there's an answer to that, and it's likely that some of you know the answer to that question, but I'd, I'd rather wonder about it than, than know the answer. I say that to say all kinds of animals can be tamed. I know that we're not supposed to enjoy ourselves at SeaWorld anymore, but when you look at the orcas, you have to wonder, if you want an orca to jump completely out of the water, how do you get him to do that the first time? I mean, how many people would it take to get in the pool with him and throw him out of the water if he didn't want to go? And if you think about it, why would he ever want to go? The point that I'm making is that all kinds of animals can be tamed, but there's one thing that can never be tamed, the tongue. That's what James means when he says what he does in verses 7 and 8. And uh, just look at the screen, pretend while I read this. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Do you hear what that says? No human being can tame the tongue. We used to have a Dalmatian named Blaze. He was the family pet. And the kids, of course, had pets of their own. Blaze was the gentlest dog we've ever owned, and, and that's partly because of the nature of the Dalmatian. One day, one of the kids who had a rabbit put the rabbit out on the screened-in porch so that it could run around a little bit, and, and soon it was time for church on that Sunday morning, and so we, without thinking, put Blaze out on the porch as well while we went to church. Partway through church, Faith and I realized the mistake that we had made, and so I told her to stay there at church with the kids while I walked home and cleaned up the mess. When I arrived at the house, I rather gingerly stepped out under the porch, not wanting to step in any of the mess, and saw Blaze lying there, sound asleep, with the rabbit snuggled in next to him, also sound asleep. Blaze was entirely tame and really much more predictable in his tameness than I had anticipated. But that's never true of your tongue or mine. No human being can tame the tongue. And that means from time to time, your tongue or mine will strike with deadly venom as we say something that's unwise and that hurts or even endangers the people who hear it. Wise people sometimes say foolish things. And because of that, if you're inclined to believe and pass along everything that this particular person says, you put yourself in danger because you will end up believing the foolish things that person says just as readily as you believe the wise things that person says. And when you pass along their foolishness, you become foolish as well. There's a flip side to this coin, and it comes from something that Jesus said. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was talking about the kind of things that we say to, to the people in our lives. And in Matthew 5, Jesus said, Anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now, before you panic, I do think carefully about what Jesus said. Look at it up there on the screen. Think carefully about what Jesus said, because if you look at it, look it up, you'll notice that Jesus didn't say if you call your brother or sister or somebody a fool that you're going to hell. Jesus said that if you call somebody a fool, you are in danger of going of the fire of hell. I believe that Jesus is talking about the consequences that can come into our lives 
when we consider a brother or sister to be a fool. Let me illustrate that. Imagine for the moment that I'm working here in my office this week, uh, uh, here in the church, and, and suddenly there's a banging on my door Wednesday morning, and the door bursts open, and it's Curtis. He's out of breath, and he's in a hurry, and he shouts, Jay, the, the church is on fire. Get out of the building as quickly as you can. He then spins around and runs off as quickly as, as Curtis can run to, to warn the other staff members and get the kids and everybody out safely from the building. Now, just imagine that I've made the decision that Curtis is a fool. Now, I, in reality, I have not made that decision and will not make that decision, Curtis, I promise. But just for the sake of the illustration, let's imagine that I think Curtis is a fool. What do you suppose is going to happen next after that warning that he gave me? Well, I'll stay there in my office until the fire brings the building down on top of my head. That's going to happen because I forgot to make a difference between what is being said and who is saying it. Hey, it's dumb to ever think that someone is so wise that they could never say anything foolish. But it's equally dumb to think that someone is so foolish that they could never say something wise. I'm trying to say that you'd better make sure your brain is engaged before you put your mouth in gear. And that takes us back to our discussion last week. You browse social media, you have those people that you follow. You make your way over to the platform that they stand on and you listen to what they have to say. You've convinced yourself that this is a wise person and you know that this person is someone very much like you. There's a connection between those things. You know that they're socially like you and you know that they're politically in agreement with you. You know that they believe essentially what you believe. You know that they're conservative like you or you know that they're liberal like you. And you don't realize that you've made the mistake of not making a difference between what's being said and who's saying it. And because you're not making that difference, you take what that normally wise person says and you pass it along without thinking about whether or not that particular thing that the person said is wise or foolish. But please remember, that's not smart. Because even wise people sometimes say foolish things. Then, just for the sake of expanding your mind, you move closer to a platform where someone who's speaking that's very different from you. They're not in the same place socially or politically. They're not conservative like you or liberal like you are. They're, they're not a Republican like you are or they're not a Democrat like you are. In fact, they're so different from, from you that, that you've come to think of them as a fool. You hear what they say from their platform on social media, and you chuckle to yourself at how foolish it is. And you just can't help yourself. You know that feeling? You start typing and pointing out that the person who is standing on this platform is a fool. And as you make that comment, you don't realize that you have once again made the mistake of not making a difference between what is being said and who is saying it. And because you're not making that difference, you take what that normally foolish person says and you attack it without thinking about whether or not that particular thing the person has said is wise or foolish. That's not smart. Because even foolish people sometimes say wise things. It's high time that we learn to think before we speak because words have weight. And what we say has consequences. It's high time that we realize that the consequences of what we say can actually be deadly. When I stand up on this platform on a Sunday morning, you require me to consider the consequences of what I say to you. And I am asking you, begging you, to take the same care when you stand on the platform of social media. I'm asking you, begging you to take the same care when you stand on the platform of the opportunity that you have in any conversation you have with anyone and anywhere. I, and I say that just in case you're the kind of person who still has real conversations with real people as you look in their eyes instead of just staring at a screen. Conversations and social media are not games. We should not be playing gotcha with anyone, especially in matters of life and death. And one more time, I want to remind you that 
that every conversation we have with someone is a matter of life and death. We want people who talk to us to learn to truly live by trust in Christ, the one who died for them, was buried and rose again, not only as their Savior, but as the Lord in their lives as well. So let's make the most of every opportunity like we learned in Ephesians, and let's treat every conversation as an opportunity to glean wise things and to pass along wise things. Let's say yes to the wise and helpful things, and let's say no to the foolishness that engenders, endangers other people. In closing, let me read the passage to you one more time. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Will you stand with me in the presence? Father and our God, I sincerely hope this morning that I haven't offended people. I sense that I have. God, we, we want to be the kind of people who always have the opportunity to say something helpful. We want to be the kind of people who always have the, the privilege, who always have the opportunity to, to look at someone else and tell them in the midst of their pain or their fear that Jesus has died for them that he was buried, and that he rose again. God, help us to understand that we shouldn't do anything that would stigmatize us and prevent us from having that opportunity. God, help us to realize that people judge us based on what, based on what we say. And perhaps, God, we don't think they have that right, but they do. They judge us. And so, God, help us to measure all of our words so that when that moment comes when we wish we want, we desire to speak the most important words of all. That person that we're talking to is still listening to us because they perceive that we're still listening to them, that we love them and don't consider them to be a fool. Thank you, Father, for your goodness in our lives. Mobilize us. Send us out. Help us to be on track in what we think and what we say for your glory. And for the good of those around us, we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. Again, I apologize if I've offended you, but uh, you still got an assignment. Um, why not, this week, why not find somebody that you can share the gospel with? Somebody that needs to hear the gospel. And, 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 and let's hope that it's somebody who's going to be willing to listen despite other comments that you may have made to them. Okay? <laughs> that did my heart good. That was rousing. <clears throat> Amen? Okay? Okay, I see how I, I need to say it. Ready? Break. Go get him, Potter's house. <laughs>